Hi, this is Gary Meese with the case against. Um, I'm going to do what I think will be a short talk today, kind of an update on the latest developments in the, the case. Um, in preface to, the, to that, to the whole thing, I'm, we're going to go back over the history of what's been going on with this. Uh, Obviously, we're talking about the West Memphis Three case in which Damien Eccles, Jason Baldwin, and Jesse Miskelly Jr. were convicted in 1994 for the May 5th, 1993 murders of Christopher Byers, Stevie Branch, and Michael Moore. Um, you know, they were tried, convicted in 1994. Uh, and would have probably faded into obscurity except for the uh, the movie makers who the documentary filmmakers who produced um, Paradise Lost for HBO uh, as a result of that film uh, the public became very aware of the case and the perceptions grew that uh, the West Memphis Three were you know n unfairly convicted you know I didn't I, I'm going to say again I've said this in the past I didn't feel after I watched the movie that they were innocent uh, I thought Damien in particular was very creepy and I, I'm not saying somebody should be convicted of murder because they were creepy but he certainly gave the impression of being capable of murder for insane reasons and since the film really didn't make clear at all that we're at what we're actually dealing with which is somebody with you know a violent history with a history of being locked up in uh, mental institutions three in one year, the year prior to his arrest for violent actions, uh, suicidal and, and at least threats of homicidal actions, you know, cutting his mother's throat, drinking blood, threatening suicide, threatening to eat his father with a spoon. Um, you know, you do that sort of thing and you act whacked out. Otherwise, they're going to put you in a mental hospital, which is a kind and generous thing to do because um, that's where you needed to be. And he stayed for a while, didn't re really, didn't seem to be responsive to treatment. Uh, you know, some a doctor, one, there's one doctor in uh, Oregon, Portland, uh, all this happened in West Memphis, Arkansas, but his family had moved briefly to Oregon. He was in St. St. Vincent's Hospital in Portland. And one of the doctors said he was just seemed to be just faking it for attention. And you know, uh, that, I, I think he's really not that mentally stable. It, it certainly wasn't back then. But I think there, he certainly exaggerated and play-acted a whole lot of this just to get attention, just to be weird. Not very different from what he's doing now, in, in essence, except what he's doing is seen as more socially acceptable, and he's trying to come across as a spiritually enlightened fellow, which he's obviously not, but he's got the patter down pretty good. Anyway, so... <clears throat> Various appeals go on over the years. The laws pertaining to DNA, change, uh, DNA retesting, change in um, Arkansas, largely as a result of this case. There's some DNA testing in 2007. You know, and up to that point, uh, <clears throat> the late Mark Byers was had been positioned over the course of the two first two Paradise Lost movies as, you know, the guy who's really capable of killing somebody because he acted pretty whacked out 
um, during the movie, but <clears throat> that truly was an act. That wasn't Mark Byers being authentic. I'm sure I, I'm, I'm, some of it was. I mean, certainly he lent a lot of his personality to it. And, you know, he's perfectly capable of going to the woods and calling on God to take, uh, I mean, calling on the devil to take Damien and Jesse and Miss Kelly and bring them to hell right now and setting fire to the woods, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He's, I think he's capable of doing that without, was capable of doing that without documentary filmmakers around. But he was basically doing it for pay. Um, there, <clears throat> he's a chronic drug abuser, uh, small-time petty, chronic drug dealer who kept getting in trouble because of his drug deals and was compromised and was some sort of police informant. Um, but he was nothing special in that regard. It's not that unusual. And um, anyway, he, um, he'd he been the prime alternative suspect up to that point. And then uh, some DNA came back with a, a small hair that may or may not belong to Terry Hobbs and mitochondrial DNA. Basically, it sh just shows that he's one of millions of people who have a, uh, they have a common female ancestor in common. That's all it really means. Um, it, you know, the incidence of that varies in different populations. Um, it varies from among the different groups of people, uh, you can have something that's very rare. I think my mitochondrial, mitochondrial DNA is one in like 88,000. And the other, the, the, the type that goes through the, uh, the, the, the father back to some common male ancestor, which women don't have that this particular element of DNA. And I, don't ask me what the name of it is, because <clears throat> I could find out very quickly, but I'm not going to do that. But basically, it's it traces back to like the earliest traceable common ancestor for all these uh, all these people. This little bit of DNA that's shared by certain groups of people, and mine's pretty rare, uh, also. So if you have those. Those two elements, you can say, well, you know, there's a really good chance that this person with this this DNA and this this element of DNA and this DNA, uh, he's at least, and he seems like a likely suspect. And you could at least narrow it down, and you couldn't build, you couldn't convict somebody on that basis. That's all you had, but it would help narrow down the field of suspects. That's not what they had with Terry Hobbs. There were literally <clears throat> hundreds of people in West Memphis alone who shared that mitochondrial DNA and millions in the United States. So the list of people it could be connected to is fair is not it's pretty huge actually when you think of millions of people. <clears throat> it's rare, you know, it's rare among uh, a group of Say a thousand, you're only likely to find just a few people with that, but you will find some more than likely. Now, so they made a big deal out of that, and actually, the hair, if it is Terry Hobbs's hair, I very well could be, you know, it's uh, hair that is explainable by transference. All three boys were in his house that day where it is quite possible they picked up one of his hairs. He lived there and they were there. Uh, it would be impossible to convict somebody on the, that single bit of evidence. And that's pretty much all they have against Terry Hobbs, except the fact that the supporters don't like him. So, you know what? He's actually a pretty likable guy from what I've seen, but they don't like him. <clears throat> Now, this goes on for a couple of years, and then 2011, uh, they they get an order for uh, 
the courts go along with the idea that, yeah, okay, we're going to let these guys go back and um, <clears throat> retest some of the evidence since there's been some new DNA technology available. Maybe we'll get a better reading on what's going on with the DNA. And they had, uh, there was an evidentiary hearing scheduled for December of 2011. There was a deadline for presenting whatever material they had that was coming up very quickly in August 2011. And lo and behold, the West Memphis Three defense goes to the prosecution and asks for, at, suggested a plea deal would be the best solution. The state had <clears throat> no real desire to retry an 18-year-old case with a lot of witnesses that would, some had died, a few had died, and quite a few would have been very hard to find, and memories over 18 years would be eroded even among trained police officers, they would have a very, you know, 18 years later, they're going to have a very much harder time of recalling details correctly. And, uh, you know, it's, they, they didn't want to retry the case. It would have been difficult. Uh, they had some new evidence, uh, quite a bit of new evidence against Jesse Miskelly since he made all those confessions. It's hard to see with six confessions or so that officially that he would be um, somebody that would just be given a pass on that basis just because he said, oh, you know, I really didn't mean to confess. Uh, and that is the primary evidence against Jesse Miskelly Jr. But it's possible they could have worked up some other evidence against him that would be telling. Certainly his al attempted alibis from 1994 would no longer work since they were discredited then and some of the relevant parties had died and are, were otherwise unavailable as far as his alibis. Uh, and their stories I'm sure would have been wildly dissimilar like eight, you know, 18 years later. Uh, Eccles uh, you know, he, he would still have faced uh, Narlene Hollingsworth's sighting story. Uh, he would still uh, have his own comments on record, plus his own testimony in the earlier case. I assume they would be able to refer to that since it's a legal record. You know, um, he would... if. He probably would not be so foolish as to take the stand again, but who knows? Um, and it's, but it's quite possible that they could have dredged up some dredged up some witnesses that would actually bring uh, uh, testify that Eccles making incriminating statements to them. That's p quite possible. Maybe a bit unlikely, but possible. As for Jason Baldwin, the biggest witness he had against him was Michael Carson. And Michael Carson, I just don't see him going back before the jury and testifying that uh, that Baldwin convict, uh, confessed to him. Don't see that happening. So it would have been a very difficult case to try. They may well have gotten off and then they could turn around and sue the state. It doesn't mean the state thinks they're innocent and it, because they went along with the idea of the plea deal. It just means that they really didn't want to try this case again. Uh, in a recent interview, Terry Hobbs said that uh, Scott Ellington told him he was just tired of the case and he wanted uh, it to go away. So this was a perfect solution for him. Uh, you know, it was a compromise between the desires of the prosecution and the desires of the defense, and both got what they wanted, even if it didn't please the public. Uh, uh, but the public aspects of it didn't please the public on either side of this question. So, you know, they're out in 2011. They're on probation for 10 years. Somehow, 
magic. I mean, Eccles, actually all three of them have violated some aspect of the probation over that time. But uh, Scott Ellington told me in a conversation I had with him when I was working at the West Memphis Times, and I wrote a story about it. It wasn't some private conversation. He said, you know, he basically was just not going to worry unless they committed some major crime, he was not going to be concerned with their day-to-day activities, whether they were working, going to school, uh, could you know otherwise be accounted for, uh, wasn't going to be checking out to see if they were hanging around with known drug addicts, uh, all the list of other stuff that they were supposed to not be doing. Uh, he wasn't going to worry about any of that. So they had, in many ways, a free pass as long as they managed not to get captured, managed not to get charged with a major felony over the 10 years. And somehow they managed that. Um, Now, so as as 2021 rolls around, two years ago, this would be 2020, no, 2019. Um, Bob Ruff, a uh, podcaster, manages to land a deal where he's doing a special for Oxygen on the West Memphis Three. Uh, Bob's very excited about all this, and he, he ends up presenting two two-hour shows four hours in total, presenting uh, his version of uh, an investigation into the West Memphis Three case. Much of it is downright ridiculous, but part of what he did was make a very large deal out of the fact that there was new DNA technology. And he, and he, his bottom line with this whole thing is, you know, if they could retest the DNA, we could find out who really did it, and the West Memphis Three would be uh, set free, and the police and prosecution and courts and the whole justice system would be discredited, and Bob Ruff would be a very happy man. Uh, so, you know, he pins down Jason and pins down Damien and really has to hunt down Jesse and basically hollers at him through a door if he's willing to have evidence retested. And Jesse, who's really avoiding the guy, says, yeah, okay. So he got the approval of the three killers. Now, these three guys, when they got out of prison, they said, oh, yeah, we're going to go out and we're going to make every effort to find new evidence and bring in the real killers. Uh, Very much like OJ, you know, real real similar sort of rhetoric. Cases are very different, but it's very similar sort of uh, rhetoric. And what have they done over the last 10 plus years? Nothing, 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 nothing. There's not even the slightest suggestion that they've done anything other than uh, make some media appearances, talk to newspapers, uh, try to build a case that they're, you know, they were wrongly convicted and therefore should be exonerated, it's, which is what they really want. Uh, it doesn't seem to really be stopping them in their day, some sort of hindrance in their day-to-day living. The fact that they're convicted child killers who pled guilty to killing three children in an Alfred plea, which they can continue to assert that they are innocent. It doesn't mean they were innocent. It certainly doesn't mean they're legally innocent. Uh, the guilty plea is an acknowledgement that the case has, the state has sufficient evidence to perhaps gain uh, another, uh, gain a conviction against them. It's a not a common um uh, plea, but it's used, you know, quite a bit. It's useful. Um, it allows some uh, the state, the courts, to be more flexible in how they handle some cases. It is, it is, you know, uh, people uh, 
plead guilty under an Alfred plea, and they are giving, you know, they might get a reduced sentence. In other words, it's part of a plea deal. It's not, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, you're, you're innocent. You can walk out the door. That's not how it works. In the case of the West Memphis Three, how it worked was they agreed to this plea deal. And as part of the deal, they agreed that all legal action against the state, any of its officers, representatives, et cetera, et cetera, was was strictly off limits in regards to this case. They could not bring new legal actions to the courts over this case. It's very clear. And they signed it willingly. They were adults. They had very high-powered, successful uh, defense attorneys, and they all signed off on this. They were all okay with this. So, of course, they haven't fought, they hadn't filed any motions for retesting in 10 years because, frankly, they can't. Well, who can? Uh, I would suggest no one. You know, uh, as far as looking at the evidence, a c- c- close and careful examination of all the evidence, Pam Hobbs and Mark Byers went to court in 2013 allegedly with the idea that Pam, as a grieving mother, wanted to see uh, items of clothing and so forth that uh, that belonged to her dead son, and it would somehow help relieve her suffering, which seems unlikely. It seems like it would just deepen her grief and deepen her obsession. And uh, Byers was a party to this at a court action, and the courts said, "No, you, we're, not, we're, you know, you're, we're not going to do that. We're not going to let you have access to the evidence." So, the parents of the dead children did not have just unlimited access to the evidence. Obviously, the case, there's a lot of things that are public record, and you can go if following the provisions of Arkansas state law, but you can go in there, a member of the public can go in there and uh, take a look at various criminal files. It's just, it's just part of, it's part of the law. And certainly you can look online to see what various actions have been made over the years, read court opinions. You certainly can read uh, Callahan site, callahanmysite.com. You can read, um, you could read for a year on all the uh, um, the court records and so forth, and still maybe still not have read everything. I have spent a lot of time on that reading off that site. That I've done a lot of other research for my books, Blood on Black, Where the Monsters Go, and the case against the West Memphis Three Killers. But I will tell you, I have not read every word on the Callahan website. It's just too huge, and there's a lot of routine legal motions. I mean, the uh, the important stuff I've read. Some some of those pieces of evidence I've read many, many times. The less important pieces of evidence I've, I've at least looked at. You know, all the trial testimony, no matter who testified, I've read all that. Uh, but in some cases, I've read testimony of, say, Eccles. I don't know. How, I've probably read it 30, 40 times at this point. Anyway, um, <clears throat> the so, but there's some things that are available and some things that are not. But just unlimited access to the evidence, it just is not, it is secured partially for the uh, protection of all the parties involved, including the people who are convicted. You don't want evidence contaminated by just anybody wandering in and handling evidence that maybe in the future, maybe, maybe, maybe somebody will be doing some DNA retesting. And, you know, they don't want any old Joe Blow's uh, DNA all over uh, somebody's uh, shirt or pants or whatever. Okay? So... The you know the, this this goes on for for years. Okay, 2013. Now we get up to the last year or so before 
uh, well, we get up to Bob Ruff. Bob Ruff decides he could just, I don't know what he thought was going to happen. You kind of got the impression he would, from his presentation that he thought he could just walk into the uh, prosecuting attorney's office and they just hand over the DNA, the evidence to him so he could go have it tested. And Bob is dumb enough that maybe he actually thought that, but maybe he's not that dumb. But he certainly made it sound like that it was going to be that simple. You know, just put in a simple request to the prosecuting attorney. I want to see the evidence, and voila, you get to, not only get to see it, but you get to have it retested. It doesn't work that way. It has to be handled through the courts. And to this date, nobody has filed a motion in the courts for retesting. And this probably would be news to a lot of supporters who now think, uh, I'm trying to get to the missing evidence thing, but who now think that because we've now confirmed, they have confirmed that all the evidence from the West Memphis 3 case is intact, uh, safe, it's been properly stored, properly cataloged, etc. Uh, there is no lost or missing evidence. Uh, but what happened was uh, Ruff and he, he himself and his supporters basically badgered Scott Scott Ellington over um, the next year or so about the possibility of somehow having access to the evidence for retesting. And Scott Ellington played a coy little game with him where he just didn't, you know, he ignored them as much as he could. And then when he couldn't, just simply felt he couldn't ignore them anymore, he started making vague promises about, at least if Ruff's version is true, and this is probably true because it sounds like Scott Ellington, he made sort of vague promises about how he was going to cooperate with them and they were going to see about getting the evidence retested, perhaps. But, you know, um, when it really came down to it, Ellington wasn't going to deliver. He was just leading Bob along, along hoping it would take some of the heat off him and, um, you know, Bob would just go away after a while. Well, Bob didn't go away. And then what happened <clears throat> was, and finally Scott Ellington, by the way, uh, pretty soon after this was appointed to a judgeship. He stopped being the prosecuting attorney uh, just about a year ago. Uh, I think he resumed, I think he stopped being the prosecuting attorney last December 31st, and Keith Cressman uh, became the prosecuting attorney. Uh, Cressman didn't, has never handled the West Memphis 3 case, and honestly, I don't know how much he knows about it, and I'm not sure there's any reason he should be particularly highly educated in it. He, it's been tried. Um, um, uh, the final disposition's been made on it. The case is closed. It's really not his business. And he's got a lot of other things on his mind. Well, anyway, Cressman, uh, now that uh, Scott Ellington uh, is off out of the picture, Cressman starts getting the same sort of uh, pressure from Ruff and his supporters with Eccles egging him on somewhat to uh, have the evidence retested. Jesse Miskelly is, except for uh, the few words he said to Bob Ruff uh, through a door for an oxygen documentary, uh, he said nothing about this publicly at all. Jason Baldwin has certainly not said very much. Um, it makes a few references. He will he will retweet something from Marl Everett, author of uh, Devil's Knot, from time to time. But as far as any original thoughts or hopes or dreams, he, he, there's been very little of that from him. He's much more concerned about posting about what music he likes, what he had for lunch, and his imagined work on those imagined uh, false 
uh, false conviction cases that he claims he's handling, even though there's really nothing to <laughs> They're all dead cases. There's nothing that's going to happen with any of those cases. They've been worked to death. They're old, and he they're easy for him because they're sort of his territory, but there's nothing going to happen with those cases. And, then, and taking credit for uh, things like Tim Howard being released on parole after serving many, many years for murder, and he's still a convicted murderer. But Baldwin acts like he's was exonerating. And Daniel Viega, in, uh, after being tried, this is a good example, Daniel Viega, over, over of the problems with retrying old cases, after being retried, I think that was his third retrial. It may have been more than that. I'm sure it was at least three trials. I could look it up. It's not that important, except Viega finally got a, a you know, he got a retrial, and then he got another retrial, and you know, it's not that unusual in these murder cases for that to happen. He finally was uh, um, exonerated. He was, you know, he was not convicted. They found him innocent. Well, you know, how much of that was the fact that witnesses had had uh, gone away or memories had gone bad and evidence had come, perhaps evidence was missing or deteriorate. Some things are going to deteriorate over time. So he got off and Eccles acts like he really had anything to do with that. I mean, not Eccles, Baldwin acts like he had something to do with that and he didn't, but, you know, he makes a big deal out of it. So let's see, where were we? Oh, yeah, Kemp... Keith Cressman, and so then after a certain point, you know, the negotiations continue, talk, you know, uh, the uh, Arkansas attorney Patrick Bink is involved in this process at some point. I mean, he dates his involvement to with the case dates back at least to the 2010-2011 era when the um, West Memphis three were working at their way through this this process to get this plea deal, and in fact, it was Binka's idea that he spun in a, a luncheon date with with uh, I, I can't think of McDaniel's first name right now, uh, Dustin McDaniel, uh, who was the attorney general. They're buddies. They're now law partners. They were not in, opposed to each other, but one supposedly representing the state and the other one supposedly representing the defense. And they worked out this deal for this process, uh, worked out at least the preliminaries on the plea deal, and Scott Ellington lapped it up because it was going to make life easier for him so he could go run for office. Daniel was going to run for office. And uh, they had other priorities rather than keeping these three killers in jail. They didn't care. Anybody who thinks they did really doesn't understand the basics here. They had nothing to do with the case. They had no emotional involvement in it. They probably had very little knowledge of the case. Uh, Ellington certainly indicated at various times he really didn't know that much about the case. So anyway, Binka was involved in those negotiations and Binka gets involved in the case again. I mean, I think he's been on the been sort of on the periphery of, with it the whole time. I think apparently he and Baldwin stay in communication. And uh, anyway, so at some point they start pressing uh, the West Memphis. The, the prosecuting attorney lets them know, you know, I really don't have access to this evidence. You need to go to the West Memphis Police Department. It's sort of late in the game, but you know, oh, oh, okay. So they, uh, you know, they get in contact with the West Memphis Police Department, or they try to, and the West Miss Memphis Police Department pretty much stonewalls them. So Binko wants to get, he starts filing Freedom of Information Act. Um, Complaints about them and citing the, you know, citing uh, their viol. They they looks like they did violate the Freedom of Information Act. They I don't know who exactly at the police department did that. 
Uh, I don't know if the chief relegated that to someone else. I, I assume he's at the top and the mayor is above him. So maybe they all could be considered to be ultimately responsible, but they could palm the responsibility off to some other officer. Anyway, word got out. Uh, the Cressman that some of the evidence might be lost or destroyed. Now, Cressman did not say who told him this. You did get you did get the impression in the context that somebody at the West Memphis the Police Department somehow imparted this information to him. The person is not identified. Uh, there were, it was all very vague, very few details. And the West Memphis Police Department was not furnishing any of these details. Binka, who, you know, to be fair about this, he was just doing his job, doing due diligence. Really, he should have been entitled to the records. The West Memphis Police Department should have come up with the records and so forth. They violated... They had, you know, they would get a, a, requ a request and so forth, and they had a certain amount of time to respond, and they just didn't respond. So the negotiations went on for a while with this, with, you know, more complaints, and Eccles at some point starts chiming in on social media about it. Um, actually, the when the evidence, the news came, the evidence was lost or destroyed. There was a firestorm on you know, the supporter pages with all sorts of uh, screaming about conspiracies and, you know, there's no evidence anymore. Uh, oh, great. And Damien started making emotion, uh, the, making um, comments via social media, you know, that this might uh, actually give him an end to... Uh, having his case totally re-examined because they didn't give a timeline. It was very unclear what the timeline would have been on this loss or missing evidence. And his theory was if it was predated, if it predated his release, then the state was not acting in good faith and really was acting in a fraudulent manner as far as the state of the evidence against him by not informing of this, this and, uh, Technically, I don't know. I'm not a, an attorney. I don't know if that was exactly a Brady violation, but it sounds very close to one. And the courts would not be sympathetic to that if they heard that. But Eccles, at the same time, has no doorway into having the case reopened, barring some sort of extraordinary circumstances. So... And they, they didn't exist. This is simply a matter of evidence not being properly accounted for. And more importantly, it's that Binko was not really looking to see the evidence so much as he just wanted to see the records. So, you know, and then uh, as this controversy continues over the course of this last, I think it's really heated up last spring, last summer, uh, you know, at some point, Bink of files a, well, actually, that was in September. But over the summer, I believe, it was Marco McClendon, who's the West Memphis mayor, who stated that he understood that some of the evidence was destroyed in a fire. And I think he actually said 2006. Well, there was a fire, but it was in 2016. Uh, I have talked... On several occasions, and not, but, but not recently, but when I worked at the uh, West Memphis Evening Times, I was the managing editor there. I talked to Marco McClendon, and, you know, not really, really often. He was on the city council, and he really didn't like how the uh, newspaper had treated his case. I don't blame him. Uh, they really had it in for him. Uh, the publishers and the previous managing editor really had it in for him. And uh, he'd opened himself up to some trouble by having, you know, some 
unsavory domestic disputes, let's shall we say, with supposedly he was stalking this woman and threatening her and all this. And I talked to her, she called me all the time. Uh, you know, some days, some day, some weeks I would get a call from her just about every day and it wasn't a short conversation, but I would sit and listen. And, you know, I did a full-fledged interview with Marco at some point. I personally kind of like the guy. I don't know how good a mayor he is. I suspect not a very good one. But he is popular in the community, so he's got that going for him. Uh, he's sort of sav- He's sort of street savvy in his own way. And uh, anyway, uh, I talked to him and, you know, got to know him a little bit. Um, <clears throat> he didn't strike me as a guy who's fundamentally dishonest, but he's also he's also struck me as somebody who plays loose with facts because he just doesn't. He's not very fact based, and uh, that was my impression. Maybe I'm wrong. And he had a reputation for having a big mouth, bragging, um, making a big deal out of things basically being a disruptive force on the city council, which is part of why he was getting in trouble. And it wasn't that hard to be a disruptive force on a city council. That city council, it's honestly not that hard to be a destruct, disruptive force on any city council. All you gotta do is open your mouth when it's unwelcome, even if you have a case that need, that should be presented. If you present it, they don't wanna hear it. It will cause a problem. You will get the rest of the council mad at you, or most of the rest of the council mad at you. You might have some sympathizers, uh, you know, particularly if the mayor views you as some sort of potential rival, you're really going to find some opposition. And depending on how the local media, when we used to actually have local media covers it, you know, you may come across as a as a crusader and a hero or as some sort of foolish bomb, but... Anyway, and Marco was somewhere between those two things. But anyway, part of what I'm getting at is if Marco says something, you know, he's, I, I, I don't, I mean, I'm sure he's told some lies, but I didn't get the impression he's a liar. But I'm also getting, I will, I will tell you, I would not put a lot of credibility in what he said in some, in, in some comment with, that's not grounded in some other source. He's not a good source of un, uh, uncorroborated information. So, but he was quoted in the press. He has some credibility as he's the mayor of West Memphis and the police chief serves at his discretion and beck and call and so forth. I have been following the ins and outs of the West Memphis Police Department uh, bureaucracy and who's in charge. I, I, I can tell you that the time I was there, in the early 2010s, there were two different police chiefs. Both of them were fairly notorious as being very tough on crime, very efficient, very hard-nosed about how they went about doing things, and not prone to put up with a lot of nonsense. In other words, they were pretty good police chiefs. And they both had good reputations Maybe that changed with time, but that was how it was. And, of course, because they were that way, they also came under a lot of criticism. I don't know what's going on since in terms of the bureaucracy, but about six months ago, apparently one police chief left, and they bring in this guy, David Pope. Six months ago, uh, this case, this whole matter was, uh, you know, had reached uh, already reached the boiling point Uh Binka filed a, uh, filed a complaint, I think, in September in circuit court complaining that the West Memphis p- police and, you know, and all the allied, all the relevant uh, city officials, et cetera, et cetera, were violating uh, Freedom of Information Act statutes, provisions, maybe not statutes. And um, then... S- and so, but I don't know how much this police chief could possibly have been involved in any of this. He certainly wasn't the guy who held evidence back over the last two years. 
and appropriately, it's, it's been held back appropriately so on some level, but they should have furnished records about the evidence and the, the, how the evidence was kept. That They should have done that. They weren't under any obligation to actually shovel the evidence toward Bob Ruff and let him run off to t- to have it retested under with, I forgot this part, MVAC technology, which was around actually when the uh, West Memphis 3 were released. It would have been, it was just breaking onto the market from what I can tell, even though the technology dated back before that. But uh, somebody who was really keeping track of that industry should have known that there was some really advanced testing available. It uses some sort of dry, a wet suction method to pull up DNA that from material that other means of gathering the DNA had uh, just weren't they weren't as efficient at. So it's like good technology, I think. And uh, you know. Too bad the West Memphis, the high-paid, uh, highly experienced defense attorneys representing the West Memphis Three didn't know about it or didn't care or didn't want to go the expense, which might have been all three. Uh, if they had known about it, they might want to go to the trouble and expense. Uh, but they didn't use this technology back when it was available. But Bob Ruff posited this as new technology. It's not new technology. It's relatively new, but it's not, you know, the last two years new. It's the last 12 or 15 years new. And it's older than the release of the West Memphis Three. Now, I did a little tangent about MVAC, Bob Ruff and MVAC, M, MPAC, MVAC technology. Ruff was, you know, he got supporters to really, really harass Ellington. Ellington obviously didn't like it. Uh, Ruff made a lot of noise. He was going to go down there and personally, you know, bat, knock down the doors and he was going to pick at the place and all that. I don't know if he's done any of that. It was during COVID and... Uh, you know, really couldn't go around knocking down anybody's door at that time. A lot of offices were closed. I don't know. Government offices were operating, certainly under stricter uh, access provisions than they would usually have. Uh, a lot of things were not being handled very efficiently then. The Anyway, uh, so Binka files a motion complaining to about the... Uh, about not having the freedom of information documents that he requested. And he sends a, a notice to the West Memphis. He, he prepares a notice to the West Memphis Police Department that's signed. There's no indication that this was ever even delivered. At least, I, you know, I checked it a few days ago. I hadn't checked it today, but a few days ago, there was no sign that uh, it had ever been delivered. It hadn't been signed off on. It was not a court order. It was, a, I would characterize as a, uh, an official request from an, uh, an attorney in, uh, in, with, uh, in reference to a certain court action that's being, that's being contemplated. And uh, promptly after that, well, not too promptly. She waited quite a while. But Marl Everett started making um, the author of Devil's Knot started making unsubstantiated claims that the West Memphis Police Department was ignoring court orders to produce these records. There was no such court order. Lonnie Sowery, a publicist for the West Memphis Three, was making similar allegations. There was no such court order. There has never been such a court order. Uh, they're not under, you know, the uh, a, a document from the attorney to them, even through the courts, and we don't have any proof that they actually ever received this document, but a document that went through the courts that doesn't have the, that is not an order from the judge, 
It's just simply a, you know, some sort of legal request. And, you know, they seem to ignore ignored all that. Now, again, they shouldn't have done that. But, you know, this went on for quite a while. Uh, well, September, it's now December. Apparently, over time, you know, they, they made back and forth claims. Oh, they're not speaking to me and they're not speaking to me. Binka and the West Memphis Police Department. And then, finally, it seems like they started acting like adults instead of petty children and worked out an agreement. And they let Binka, not Damien Nichols, Damien Nichols has filed nothing in this case uh, since some, you know, his appeals back way before he ever, and, you know, his attorneys did that, but his name has not been attached to anything in the court since 2011. He, uh, Binka and the West Memphis Police Department work out a deal that's going to allow Binka to come in and survey the evidence and see what's actually missing and what's lost. Well, he goes in the other day, and it turns out nothing's missing, nothing is lost, everything's cataloged. I mean, from the wording of the statement, it sounds like he was kind of impressed with how well it's been stored and handled. Now, and I think I may have alluded to this, but I didn't really explain this. Part of what, okay, part of what happened uh, between sometime, sometime more recently, I don't exactly when this came, the information came out that uh, there had been a fire at a container in 2016 in West Memphis uh, that contained various sorts of police evidence. Uh, It's probably arson, but nobody was charged, convicted. You know, know, maybe we're doing an alleged with this. It was arson. But uh, the... And maybe it wasn't intentional. Maybe they were smoking a cigarette and threw it down after they got through pawing through the evidence. I don't know about that. But um, what happened was, uh, oh, well, a couple of handguns, I believe they were, a couple of firearms, and I believe their handguns were found missing and maybe some other items. And uh, a box of West Memphis Three evidence was found 100 feet away from this container in a field. Now, apparently the evidence, it was, if there's no word that it was ever, it certainly wasn't destroyed by fire if it's in a field. Uh, there's no, from what Binka's statement suggests, is there's no ev- no suggestion that any of this evidence is missing or mishandled or uh, crispy from a fire or Uh, you know, unreadable because of the way it's been handled or anything. It's all okay. So apparently they they retrieved this box and put it back with wherever they put the evidence after they cleaned out this trailer where this fire occurred. And, uh, you know, the state is under an obligation to try to preserve this evidence uh, because it's a prominent murder case. Uh, There's some question, there's been question, Pam Hobbs, Pam, Pam Hobbs, Pam Hicks, whatever. She prefers Hicks, and I'm okay with that. Uh, and and uh, buyers, you know, were basically arguing, well, you know, the case is over with. It was 2013. The case is over with. We should be able to have access to this evidence. And the state, the state has put this provision in that in certain cases, the evidence is supposed to be maintained to end perpetuity, uh, and I'm sure they have good reasons for doing that. And I'm sure you could even think of what the good reasons might be, such as some, <laughs> something else popping up out of the blue, somebody actually confessing to a crime. And, you know, maybe they actually have evidence that he, somebody else did it. There's no evidence anybody else did the West Memphis uh, three killings. There's no evidence anybody killed Michael, Christopher, and Stevie, except Jesse, Damien, and Jason. But, you know... I've said this before all, many, many times, but, you know, maybe there were just the three unluckiest teenagers in the world who just happened to say and do all the wrong things and got themselves convicted. And I'll say Jason actually didn't say much of anything, so let's just say Eccles and Miss Skelly uh, 
managed to say and do things that got them convicted. Okay, you know, a long list of, of factors played, a long list of evidence, some of it presented in court, some of it not presented in court, suge- just leads to what, for me, is an inescapable conclusion that they were guilty of actually committing this crime. I know people disagree. Most of the ones who disagree don't have much information about the case. And they discount the information. If they are presented with that information, they discount it and say, well, you know, just because somebody says they're homicidal on a a Social Security application doesn't really mean that, you know, they're actually homicidal or they would kill anyone. Well, you know, they and they have a, a point there. Yeah, it doesn't exactly mean that. You wouldn't convict somebody on that basis. But when you have a friend of theirs who confesses to police that this guy killed somebody, and then you point to the Social Security form, and he says on there that he's homicidal, and you go back through his mental health records, and he talks about violent acting out. Uh, I mean, he talks about his violent fantasies, and... Uh, he, uh, you know, got kicked out of school a number of times for things like fighting and trying to uh, gouge out uh, uh, classmates' uh, eyes with his long vampire-like fingernails. You know, none of that proves, again, none of that proves, oh yeah, he doesn't prove exactly that he killed these boys, but it certainly leads to the leads you to understand he's exactly the kind of person who would have killed these boys and done it in in such a frankly a bizarre and sickening manner as he did it. And he's a bizarre and sickening individual. I don't mind saying it. Uh, he's He was the instigator in all this. Jesse honestly was a, a patsy and I'm not really cutting him a lot of slack. He beat poor Michael Moore to death, and frankly, he deserved to die for that. And I'm not really an advocate for the death penalty because of the way it's applied, but I wouldn't care if he was, got the death penalty for that applied to him. And Jason Baldwin is a real, was actually the worst monster of all. And I think he probably was the moral, immoral fiber, if you will, that Damien didn't quite have as far as actually carrying out the crime because Jason was the knife man. And I am convinced that Jason Baldwin is um, lacks a conscience. And, you know, there's a name for people who lack a conscience, but I'm not going to say that exactly. But let me say this. Damien Eccles described himself as a sociopath on his Social Security application. And so, you know, sociopaths either have very impaired conscious, a very impaired conscious, or no conscious at all. And I'm suggesting that Damien has no conscious, and his friend Jason has no conscience. They're two of a kind. One uh, is very, one of them, for all the show, is really probably a bit of a weakling and a bully, while the other, who seemingly is harmless, is actually deadly. So, what we have now, just this week we have information that the West Memphis 3 evidence, no problems with it. So where are we with the West Memphis 3 case? Well, pretty much where we were back in 2011, despite all the noise. There's been no movement for retesting. There's been, there's, uh, there's really no obvious venue toward retesting. Um, who's going to make the motion to, to the courts that, for retesting? The prosecuting attorney, if he <clears throat> is weak and, uh, is willing to fold under pressure. I mean, he presumably could go back in and order retesting on the, on some sort of basis. I don't know how he would justify it to his taxpayers 
uh, the taxpayers and the voters, but uh, you know he could he could do that. I don't see that happening in this case. It would be it would be very expensive to test all the evidence, very very expensive, and it would be at the state expense unless the West the West Memphis three people probably would love to just to test the, the shoelaces. And I suspect they wouldn't get what they think they're going to get, but you know that's what they that's what Binka said he had. He had the ligatures. The tie, the, the the strings that were used to tie the boys' hands to their feet in that bizarre fashion that wasn't really hog tying, but resembled that, except you don't tie left to left and right to right in hog tying. It doesn't really um, render the limbs immobile. If you're conscious, you could very easily get out of knots. Uh, that kind of um, that kind of binding. So what we have is we're really just sort of back to square one. You know, I've, uh, I'm very busy with other things that have absolutely nothing to do with true crime, uh, West Memphis three case, uh, criminal justice system, legal matters, hopefully, et cetera, et cetera. Some peripheral legal matters. I mean, you know, uh, very, very peripheral, you know, some things have to be done by the book, but, you know, I've taken on recently taken on some new responsibilities. Uh, and I'm not even going to go into details because I, you know, it's really my business. Uh, if anybody really cares, uh, I don't mind saying what it is, but, uh, my friends all know, you know, I have friends in various spheres, but those friends in the various spheres certainly know what I'm doing, they, it's nothing weird or nothing weird or even unusual. But, and, you know, beyond that, I would love to be writing. I, I really would love to acquire the, reacquire some discipline as far as writing. And, uh, you know, I've had, a, a, I will say I've had a, a minor but aggravating health condition for a couple of months, which has made concentrating on things more difficult than it usually is for me and I'm pretty old so I, I spent about an hour just getting cranked up every day but uh, so there's a lot of things in, and then I, I there's things I do every day through every weekday for three or four hours different things but things so you know, altogether, I'm just not really as involved with the West Memphis Three case as I once was, which I don't need to be. There's nothing happening with it. But I am going to continue to produce this podcast for, you know, until it basically at least get through the case against the West Memphis Three Killers book, uh, until I finish the occult crime book. At the rate I'm going, it's going to be a couple of years because I've been very uh, lagging in producing new episodes. But, uh, you know, I'm about, uh, hopefully, even though I've taken on new responsibilities, I really do, th I had some stuff that was really very disruptive for like the last three months. Again, I'm not going to get into personal details. But it's been very disruptive, not in really in a bad way, just a disruptive way. Uh, throws me out of my various routines, makes it harder to plan things. Uh, and, you know, I hope to produce more regular content but if I don't it's no big deal the case isn't going anywhere I'm not going hopefully I'm not going anywhere and uh, you know there there are people there are people who are advocating for the guilt of the West Memphis three on Facebook all the time uh, particularly notable West Memphis three facts People who aren't familiar with that can go check that out. Uh, there are some other people who are other people who uh, would argue for the guilt of the West Memphis Three, and almost invariably, and they when they come up in um, social media before they get around to purging the the comments, uh, they they get comments concerning their that the fact that they're guilty, that they're child killers, that they're disgusting human beings. Uh, good for those people. I know it doesn't really do much good, and it's, sometimes it seems like uh, 
a little drop of rain in a desert, but so be it. I'm not sure that many people think these guys are actually innocent. It's just that the ones who do think he's in, they're innocent are very vocal and very nasty in their own right, for the most part. A few decent types. Most of them are really horrible people. Anyway, that's enough from me. I talked much longer than I thought I was going to, but I wanted to do a rundown on the so-called missing evidence that turned out not to be missing. Merry Christmas to y'all. Happy New Year. Uh, thanks for listening.